My name is Eric Silverberg. I am the CEO and co-founder of Scruff. We are one of the largest gay social dating apps on iOS and Android. And I'm going to tell you a story about uh, sex, privacy, and how we fundamentally changed our approach to advertising. So, um, Scruff, we are one of the largest gay dating apps. We've had more than 15 million members join since we first launched in 2010. Um, we, we serve uh, several million uh, members every single day. And um, gay dating, it is an interesting part of the tech ecosystem. It is uh, frequently overlooked, but um, gay, bi, trans, queer people are often early adopters of new technology and new communication mediums. Uh, the technology is also a lot more complicated than I think most people recognize. We have to build a global messaging platform similar to WhatsApp and a globally browsable content database similar to Pinterest, and that's just, that's just table stakes. Um, we are also an app and a community that is uniquely sensitive to concerns around data privacy and data security. And I think you all can uh, understand and imagine why. So in the United States, where we first got our start, uh, you can be fired in more than two dozen states for being gay, bi, trans, or queer, you can easily envision what would happen if, for example, a healthcare company were to gain access to our list of members and used that information to raise someone's healthcare premium or even drop them from coverage entirely. And as you can see here, um, there are places around the world where you can be imprisoned or even killed if you are found to be a member of our community. So consequently, data privacy and data security are an existential concern and consideration for our community and for our company. So uh, as I said, uh, we got our start in 2010. We were one of the first uh, gay apps on iOS, the first on Android, and I went back into uh, our archives to pull out these uh, screenshots from what our app looked like um, back then. And in the beginning, our business model was based on advertising. So uh, the ad networks provided us with that crucial, crucial early revenue uh, because our company is somewhat unique in that we are bootstrapped. We never took any outside funding, any venture funding. So these ad units that you can see up here were our sole source of revenue for the first uh, almost two years. And many of you probably recognize uh, the ad unit at the bottom. It was uh, made popular. Uh, by a company called AdMob, and you saw, you saw that ad unit all over the mobile internet. Then for a while, Groupon seemed to buy all of the ad inventory, and every uh, banner ad you saw was, was promoting them. There was the uh, Clash of Clans era, where all the banner ads were, were Clash of Clans. And so um, uh, each one of these, uh, we experienced each one of these uh, periods, and um, as I said, uh, these, um, uh, these ad networks provided us with that crucial early revenue. And we basically set a, uh, a record in 2012. Um, and this would be a, a five-year uh, record for our business in terms of ad revenue. And then after that, it kind of flatlined and trailed off. And we had a number of issues with the various third-party ad networks with whom we had integrated. So AdMob, for example, uh, they held up almost six figures of ad revenue for three months in 2012. We had to essentially beg our way, uh, make, get, get inroads into the company, and beg them to release it, which thankfully they did. Had they made that decision a year earlier, it probably would have been fatal to our business. Uh, another company that we had been working with uh, called Millennial Media, they suspended us for three months 
would not return any of our calls, any of our emails. Uh, it turns out uh, one of their competitors made it known to one of their advertisers that their ads were running on a gay app. And at least back then, there was still a lot of, frankly, homophobia in the advertising industry. And uh, the advertisers didn't like that their ads were running on Scruff. So uh, Millennial had to make some changes. And it took about three months for them to, uh, to let us back in. iAds was another third-party ad platform. It was Apple's uh, entrant into this market. Uh, unfortunately, iAds never was able to deliver more than uh, a fill rate of, of much more than 10%, meaning 90% of the time that we were requesting an ad, we got nothing. Uh, Google would, uh, an ad mob, eventually would suspend us uh, from running ads on Android, uh, and it ultimately came out that Google was not interested in working with any apps in the gay dating space. Uh, we didn't end up getting back onto that platform for about four or five years. But fortunately, by that time, we had moved over to um, uh, other ad platforms, Mopub, um, Smato, which is a company, I think, based here in Germany. And uh, those, uh, those were companies who um, were willing to work with us, but we found were plagued by um, spammers and attack ads. So literally, um, what would happen, a, a few times a year, you would launch Scruff, and you would be immediately taken out of our app to a random place on the internet. And none of these DSPs, as they're called, were either willing or able to solve this problem. So fortunately, our business made the decision to focus on subscriptions and really focus on building a great software platform, something people were willing to subscribe to directly. And so our ads business kind of went sideways for a while. Fast forward to 2018, OK? GDPR takes effect. And this prompts our business, this prompts our company to take a hard look at all of our third party uh, suppliers and vendors, all of the companies with whom we are working and sharing data. And you can be sure that started with the third-party ad networks. And so it quickly became clear that if we were to continue to integrate with these third-party ad networks, we would have to provide a disclosure that looks something like this, a very onerous disclosure during the first run, during the initial setup of our app that would ask our members if they consented to having their data shared in exchange for targeted relevant advertising. Now, this was a question that uh, as technologists, as software developers, quite frankly, we would never, we would never answer yes ourselves to this question. And, and moreover, we knew the, the, this, this, this question, we knew this to be fundamentally false, because in the nearly seven, almost eight years that we had been running our app by that point, we had never seen relevant, targeted banner advertising in our app. Okay, it, that, that, that promise was never realized for the members of Scruff. We were seeing, you know, the run of network ads, the group on Clash of Clans, but we would see like straight dating apps, obviously not relevant to our community. We saw those, those those apps that promise to like clean your Android phone, just real bottom of the barrel advertising. And so we made the decision at that time to remove our uh, third party ad networks, not only for our members in the EU, but also for our members globally. We pulled third party ad networks out across the board because it's very important to us, it's very important to me, that we are able to stand up in front of our community and speak openly and speak candidly about the business decisions that we make and about the values that we have as a company. So um, at, at that time, um, this was what our ad revenue looked like. Um, so it was meaning, a meaningful amount, but as you can see, it was, had essentially gone flat or sideways despite the order of magnitude growth that we had experienced uh, since, since we first got started. 
Um, so we, we, we made this decision to, uh, to pull all third-party uh, ad networks. But uh, we, we also, as I said, we evaluated our technology stack top to bottom. We ended up uh, removing an integration with an install attribution company. Uh, many of you in, in the software business have probably heard of that. It helps you understand how your ad campaigns work. We removed them so that we could uh, do all of this work, and we continue to do all this work in-house, so we could maintain control of that very, very sensitive data. We also worked very hard to make sure that as we were complying with GDPR, we could bring that uh, and, and uh, provide that to all of our members globally. And uh, it was a technical challenge. Uh, some of the aspects, uh, such as data, um, uh, data exporting, uh, were a bit easier for us to do. Others, for example, data deletion was a technology um, and, and was a, a process that took us almost a year to complete from start to finish because when we got started, the, te the technology for that didn't yet exist. Um, so at the same time that we reevaluated our technology stack, we also began in earnest uh, an in-app advertising platform, okay? A direct ad sales program. So we have this now today, and um, we built a custom technology based on something called React Native. It's a technology that many of you here have probably heard of. It's provided by Facebook. And as you can see, it gives us the ability to render very beautiful edge-to-edge -edge advertising. These are custom layouts. These render the same on both iPhone and Android. They also work on different screen sizes. These are using native components. Uh, they can incorporate video and motion. Um, and you can see there's a, a big, uh, big button at the bottom inviting members to tap if they're interested. And the most important thing about this ad unit is that this ad unit does not share data, okay? We do not share information with, uh, with this fashion advertiser. The one on the right is an internal ad for our Instagram. But we do not share information with advertisers. If the member actually taps the button to visit the website and, the, and you know, take up the offer, then the advertiser can collect their email address, uh, collect their name, phone number. Then they can create a relationship, but not until that point. Contrasted with the third-party ad networks who are constantly inhaling information, collecting information, often without the knowledge of the people who are seeing the ads. And I'm happy to report that we have had a tremendous response to this direct advertising campaign. You can see we, are, we have improved ad revenue by 50% from its peak with zero dollars coming in from these third-party ad networks. Now, yes, we certainly did leave money on the table, uh, and it could have been even higher had we continued to collect uh, revenue from these third-party ad networks, but it, we felt that it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do for our community. And uh, I think more importantly, we are at an inflection point in our industry where our members, our, our users, the, the, the broader public is going to ask hard questions, questions about our values as technologists, as software engineers, as CEOs, and we have got to be prepared to answer those questions candidly, honestly, and openly. And I actually uh, would, would submit to you that what we are seeing in the tech industry today is not dissimilar from what we saw in the food industry back in the 1950s and 1960s when food labeling first began, and I would submit to you that if you were to ask someone in the early 1960s, before labels like this had become commonplace, you were to ask someone, what are carbohydrates? What are saturated fats? They would have looked at you like you were a crazy person. And yet today, 
those very complex scientific concepts are at the core of how consumers every single day make buying decisions. I did some, some more research and I found this quote. It is certain, this is from a Frito-Lay executive, by the way, in 1990, a huge food conglomerate. He said, it is certain that should all of the information that the FDA is currently proposing be included on a label, it would overwhelm and easily exceed the capacity of the average consumer to understand it. And you know what? He was right. He was right. All that information on those labels would have exceeded the, the, the capacity of the average consumer to understand it. But you know what? Consumers got smarter. Regulators got smarter. The industry got smarter. And that, I submit to you, that is what we are facing as a technology industry today. We have got to get smarter. We have got to do better. We have got to stand behind our business practices and disclose them openly, honestly, and candidly, because consumers are going to start making their app installation decisions. They're going to start shifting their scarce screen time away from the apps that do not value their data and their privacy and their security and to apps that do. And that is why our company chose to take a leadership position on this issue, chose to forego revenue, bring it all in house. This was a decision that I believe will make good business sense and is also good for our community and good for our industry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric. <coughs> Eric. Uh, so we'll, we'll hit it with the questions. Um, so the first one up is the question from Anonymous. Uh, as a publisher with a massive audience, it probably, whoa, ah, it's changed on me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's probably easier to persuade advertisers for a direct buying model. How would you approach it as a small startup? Uh, that is a, an excellent question, and um, uh, I'll be honest, I think uh, running ad-driven business models are especially difficult these days. My recommendation, quite frankly, is focus on delivering something of tremendous value to the audience that you serve. Find something that you believe there is an audience who is willing to pay for, and keep your burn rate as low as possible, okay? We, we are here, I am here able to take a very principled, some might argue very strident position on this issue because I enjoy the freedom and the flexibility of not having a board, not having venture investors who are able to control what I can say or afraid of you know, ruffling feathers. And that, was, that is a direct, direct result of the fact that we did not take any funding, that we really worked to figure out our model, to build our audience organically. And um, I think if you take a, a patient approach, understand what value you're trying to create, um, you will find people who are willing to pay and you will be able to build a business model that is not based on selling the data of your members. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely, and I think <clears throat> we have time for one more. So, uh, how do you curate ads targeting the LGBTQ community and what are your criteria? Yeah, that's a really, really excellent question because we absolutely do curate our ads. And, uh, you know, fundamentally, uh, our mission is to connect gay, bi, trans, and queer guys with each other and with the global community. And that community includes advertisers. It includes these small businesses, businesses uh, who oftentimes are discriminated against from running ads on major platforms, Facebook, Google. And so uh, it's important to us and to me that we don't perpetuate that discrimination through body shaming or sex shaming. I mean, there are many products, you know, like condoms or lube that face discrimination when they try to advertise that we certainly don't want to do. That said, it's important to us that anything that we're promoting and advertising, first of all, understands that they are reaching a queer audience and is promoting something that is going to benefit and improve our community. So, um, for example, we, we say no to um, 
Uh, we say no to products that make like dubious health claims or a lot of supplements. We'll just, we'll just say no to that. Um, but we have a lot of health advertisers. And um, interesting story, actually, um, perhaps my last anecdote, an interesting story on that. So um, when we first launched our direct ad program, we had a major health company approach us. They were willing to offer us a six-figure check, the largest such check we would have ever received by a long shot if, if we were willing to disclose the advertising ID of the members who received their ad. And we said, you know what, that is an easy decision. Absolutely not. They said, well, your competition will do the same. We said, great, go advertise with our competition. We will not do this. And I'm happy to report, several months later, they came back and they bought an ad without the data being shared. So you can do it. Thank you so much, Eric. Great. Thank you.